My name is Bill Kennedy. And I really appreciate all of you spending the next hour and a half with me. I know that sounds like a lot of time, but it's going to go by fast. And hopefully you've got a beer or a little whiskey, my favorite, next year. I mean, it's, it's you know, it's, it's late enough to have a beer. Go grab one. Let's do it. And I hope you uh, hope you enjoy the talk. So we're going to be talking about the new syntax that's being proposed for generics in Go. Again, this is a proposed draft syntax. It has not been implemented yet at all in the compiler. We just have a tool called Go to Go that will let us um, prototype and experiment and play with the new syntax so we can learn from it and make hopefully the best decision uh, when it is time to implement this in the compiler. When could that possibly be? When could we see an actual release of this? Uh, my best guess is going to be the February release of 2022. Just my guess. I have no insight. Do not work at Google. Do not work for the Go team. Uh, but my guess is we're looking at February 22. Could be, it could be the August release before. It could be the August release after. But I, I think it's it's a safe safe bet. We've got a lot of work to do still. And the syntax is still up in the air. And this uh, conversation I'm going to have with you uh, tonight is really to try to present to you the bulk of the syntax, understand why we even need new syntax, um, and then give you all an opportunity to kind of talk about it and share your thoughts and opinions. There is um, a, a chat stream here uh, that I've been told. So I would love for everybody, even if it's just on their particular platforms that they're watching me on, uh, to have group discussions while I'm talking. I won't be able to take questions during the talk, but I'll be uh, more than happy to take questions after. And there's a good chance that I'll answer some of those questions by the time I'm done as well. But please have the group conversation. I will inject my own thoughts and opinions on this as we go as well. All right, with all that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm hoping that you can see this, uh, my hosts here. If nobody can see that just yet, let me know. Also, um, if at any time this transmission is breaking up, you can't hear me or see me or you can't see the material, um, speak up in one of the chats and the hosts will let me know. I don't want to waste time talking if nobody can, can understand what I'm saying. Now, I did ask the hosts to share three links with you. Um, you should have those on your chats. The first link was to this repo here at Arden Labs Go Training, where all my Go Training material is. Now, you can see there's 13 different examples. We will not be able to get through all 13 in an hour. I'm not even going to try. What I'm going to be doing is sharing the first five examples with you. If we can get through the first five, then you will have seen and hopefully understand the bulk of what the draft document is attempting to provide for the first release of generics, maybe maybe around February 22. Now, if you move into the README, there's a link over here, and that will open up to the second link that I provided, which is the draft design document. You can see it was updated back in August 28th. Um, and if you want to go a little deeper into the draft design, and this is the document to read, and I'm going to be trying to help you not have to read this by sharing what it's describing. There's also a Go to Go Playground link here in the README. And this is a special Go Playground that will allow you to experiment and play with the syntax. It uses the Go to Go transpiler, same one I'm going to be running at my desk. Now, if you have questions related to actual code or things that you've been ex uh, experimenting with while I'm talking, please put that code in a playground link, hit share, and then you can share that link with me at the end of the talk, and we can go over that. I'm not going to read this, but this is the high-level overview of what the draft for the first release of generics is looking at um, providing in terms of feature functionality. This list could change. It could get larger or smaller depending on what we learn over the next six months to a year um, trying to figure out the syntax. 
I'm not going to read it. You can look at it. It will be the bulk of what we talk about today. This is a list of omissions, things that are currently not being discussed or experimented with for the first release of Generics and Go. It doesn't mean it may not make a second release. It actually doesn't even mean it may not make a first release if we identify as a community that something here is critically important to have day one. Um, but you can read that. It's also in the draft document. That's where I took it from. Uh, and you get a sense of what we're not going to be showing today. I do have some extra links to blog posts I've written that I'm continuing to write and some from others in the Go community. And I'm going to be running the GoToGo Go transpiler locally. And these are the instructions that I followed to be able to do that. It's basically pulling down Go source code, checking out the GoToGo Go branch, and then building a version of Go from that. And um, what you'll see here is that if I type Go version, it doesn't say 1.15.1, which is the latest, greatest version of Go. You can see that this was built from uh, source code that was updated as of yesterday. And this is going to give us access to the Go to Go tooling. Great. All right. With all of that being said, and time always against us, I'm going to jump in and start looking at some code. This first example I'm going to go very slow with because I really want to make sure we understand not just the new syntax, but why we even need some new syntax that helps. Um, and then we'll go through more and more examples, at least the, just the five, although get a little bit more complex as we go. Uh, but it's a good showcase of what we're looking at and the new syntax that we need. So let's jump into the very first um, sample code here. 401. Now, one of the things that I'm going to do is walk through a progression of, of code, um, things that we can do today, and then we'll introduce what the generics will allow. And the big focus on everything here is not going to be on performance. Forget about that. We don't know anything about that right now because we don't know really how this all gets implemented. Not the concern, but the concern needs to be is, is generics allowing us to write code that is, or at least maintains the same high level of comprehension and readability. And that's the focus as well tonight. So if you look at line 13, I'm writing a function named print numbers. And print numbers accepts a collection of integers in the form of Go's data structure, a slice. And there we have a slice of int. Now, in order to display these individual numbers related to that collection of integers. I'm using five lines of code. I'm using fump.print to print a label. I'm using our four range mechanics here to be able to do at linear traversal across that collection. Then I use a print again for each individual integer, and then I do a carriage return line feed. What's nice about this code is I'm able to use language syntax and language mechanics to write it. And these five lines of code uh, I'm going to make a bold argument is code that the majority of Go developers, even if you're only two weeks into the language, can read and comprehend. I'll even take it to the next level. I think even if you're looking at Go for the first time and you're not for terribly familiar with the syntax, you could still read and comprehend what these five lines of code are doing. And that's one of the beautiful things about Go, isn't it? That we have a language... We have a syntax and we have mechanics that, um, that, that aren't trying to be novel or new and give us the ability to comprehend and read code fairly quickly. Now, if I wanted to do the same thing but work with a collection of strings where I'm going to have a slice of string, I really need a new function because the data input is changing. And then I would like to make my variables be more, you know, uh, more readable term to the type of data that we're going to be iterating over. But essentially, the five lines of code that I wrote for print numbers is the same for print strings minus the idea that we're using different variable names and type. And if I wanted to do this once again, but be able to print a collection of floating point numbers, well, it's going to be another copy and paste and changing type information and variable names. However, Maybe that isn't so bad because each function by itself has the highest level of comprehension and readability. And that's, I think, really important when we're writing code. 
But I hear you. I know what you're saying. You're saying, Bill, what if I'm going to do this for 10 different types? You're telling me I got to write 10 different functions. So let's run a thought experiment here and say, well, let's say, let, let's, let's imagine that it's important not to have these two functions. And maybe it would be nice to consolidate these two functions into a single function to help with the you know, the maintainability of the code base. But again, we don't want to lose our readability and comprehension. So is there a way in Go today to consolidate these two functions or three or four functions into one and still be able to use our language syntax and mechanics and then have maybe a little less code to maintain? And the answer is yes, we can. If we use two aspects of the language that exist today, one, the empty interface, and two, type assertions. Now, if you see here, we're going to have a single function. I've called it print assert, and it's using the empty interface as the input type. And what we're doing here is saying that we will accept any concrete piece of data as long as it, well, this is the key. It's not as long as it behaves in a certain way. Interfaces are, give us the ability to implement polymorphism in Go, where we can accept data not based on what it is, but based on what it can do. And what's special about the empty interface is that it doesn't describe anything about what the data needs to do. It doesn't have to do anything. And therefore, the empty interface gives us the mechanic for being able to pass any data we want into this function. Now, there are no compile time checks, so now we have to do things at runtime. But it is going to allow us to accept a slice of int or string or float or user uh, and be able to handle that in one function. So we've got our label here. And then what we're going to use is a type assertion. We'll call this a generic type assertion. We're using the keyword type, which works on the switch statement. And then this allows us to write conditional logic and ask the question, if the concrete data that was passed in now stored inside of V if that is a slice of int, then execute these lines of code. If the concrete data that was passed in is a slice of string, execute these lines of code. And if it's anything else, we won't have any output at all. But what's nice is we are still using our language syntax and mechanics, and we are using variable names that make sense for the type that we're working with. So overall, um, this isn't really a generic function. We get to maintain our use of language syntax and mechanics, but it's still only limited for those cases that we implement. If I pass a slice of floating point numbers, we're not going to see anything. So the next question I think we need to ask ourselves is, well, is there a way at all to write a generic function of print that can accept a slice of int, string, float, user, whatever, and provide an output of those individual values in that collection? And the answer actually is yes. We can do this um, in Go today. I don't need anything special or new. Now, in order for this to work, we do have to walk away from our language mechanics and syntax and now focus on a package API and use the reflect package from the standard library. Now, we're going to use the empty interface once again as our input type because, again, we can't restrict what type of data we pass in here, and we don't care what the data can do. Again, now we have a problem in that there's no compiler checks that we're only getting slices. So in order to work with the reflect package API, the first thing we do is what we see on line 58, and we perform a value of call that gives us a reflect value that lets us perform runtime inspection. And we could do things like, is the concrete data stored inside of V, was that a slice? And if it's not, we can just return with no output. And then if it is a slice, we can't use our for range mechanics. That's no longer available to us. But I can increment a variable i based on the length of that slice using the method len off of val. And then I can perform that linear traversal by using the method index passing i. And I call interface to get to the data itself, and then I can print it. And so you can see here that this function using the reflect package isn't tied to any one given type of slice. It's really a generic function 
in the sense that we can display the individual values of any slice. Now, again, there's runtime checks. Those semantics are a little bit different here on these returns. We could potentially not display anything, but we do have it. Now, if you think about these eight lines of code, we've had to use three more lines of code than we did before. And I can't make the same exact argument that all that Go developers at all different levels can comprehend and read this code. And that's because we're not using our language syntax and mechanics anymore. We're using an API. And if you're not familiar with these methods, then you're just going to not be familiar with the code. And so though we can write generics today in Go using the reflect package, we are walking away from compile time checks. We are having to use an API instead of our language syntax and mechanics. And that is not necessarily making the code that we have to write and maintain more comprehensible and readable uh, for more developers. Right. OK. And one thing you should also think about is how we're using print in all the functions I'm writing. I mean, print is a generic function as well. It does allow you to display an output for any piece of data that you pass into it. Print is using the reflect package as well to do that. So there we are. I've got the ability to write separate concrete functions. I have the ability to consolidate those concrete functions, right? I can write separate concrete functions, but I may have to write many. I have the ability to consolidate all of that into a single function. And then I have the reflect package that would let me actually write a generic version of this behavior. But the question then is, is there value in being able to write a generic version of print that allows us to still work with our language semantics and our language mechanics? And I think the answer is yes, because when we can use our language syntax and mechanics, then we're able to write code that's more comprehensible and readable. We don't have to worry about learning a reflect API. We get to let, use the language itself. And I think this is a place where this first draft, this first version of generics is going to be a big win for us. Anywhere that we're using the empty interface, anywhere we're using type assertions and reflection could be an opportunity to use generics. Now, I'm a big fan of reflection. When it comes to data validation and marshalling and unmarshalling, I don't see generics replacing that type of behavior. But I think there are places where if we can get back to our language syntax and mechanics, we're going to have code that's more readable and comprehensible. Now, this is a version of print using the new syntax being proposed for generics in the draft document. And before I explore this anymore, I want you to look at these five lines of code. And I want you to notice that these five lines of code are really identical to the five lines of code we started with when we were writing concrete versions of this print function for both the int and the string slices. And that's because we're back to using our language syntax and mechanics. We're displaying a label. We're using our four range for linear traversal. We're displaying each individual value. The print function is helping us there with their use of reflection. And then we have a carriage return line feed. And I think I can make the argument again that these five lines of code, even though this is going to be a generic function, is more comprehensible and readable to many more Go developers. Now, I'm going to get rid of some of the new syntax here for just a second. And you're going to see me doing this throughout the talk because I find that if you're a Go developer like I am and have been coding for a little while, you know, you all your eyes are already in tune with the syntax. So I want you to look at these this code that I'm going to present with those eyes first. And then we'll introduce the new syntax so you can see how it lays in. And again, I really want to talk about why we need it. Now, take a look at the function that I have here and the way it is. You can kind of understand what I'm trying to do here, right? by using this just letter T as an identifier, right? I'm not using int, I'm not using string, I'm just using T. And I think you can get a general sense of what I'm trying to accomplish here. 
What I'm trying to do is write a function that can accept a slice of some type T to be determined at compile time not to be determined before compile time, but to be determined at compile time. Some type T. If I can define this T as a generic type to be determined later, but assuming that it will be a concrete type at the end of the day, then I can come back and use my language syntax and mechanics and write code. The problem is, is that we have backwards compatibility issues that we have to be able to maintain. This isn't going to be part of a major two branch of Go. This is still going to be in a major one branch of Go where we still have backwards compatibility promises. And I'm really happy about that. And so if I leave the function like this, then the compiler is expecting that before I hit the build button, that somebody in some source code file for this package has done something similar as line 80. This function on line 82 assumes that type T is going to be defined somewhere in the code before the build button is hit and that the compiler is going to be able to see it. Now, the whole point of the generic function is the exact opposite. I don't want to do this. T isn't trying to represent a type that's going to be pre-declared before build. T needs to represent a generic type to be determined later. And so this is why we need some new syntax, because we need to find a clear way to tell the compiler that T is going to be a generic type to be determined later, to be determined at compile time. Now, the draft currently is supporting this syntax for declaring a set of generic types, in this case, for function. And you can see here the use of the square brackets attached to the right-hand side of the function name. Now, it's these square brackets that define a list of generic types. And you can have more than one if you need them. But right now, all I need is one. Now, there is something else in the draft document as it relates to this list of generic types. Every type that we define in this list must have an associated constraint. We must tell the compiler if and how these generic types are constrained because sometimes we have to make sure that, in this case, T can only be of a certain class or caliber of type. Now, in this example here, there is no need of any constraint on T. T can be anything, which is why you're seeing the word any here. And any is a pre-declared identifier given to us for free that represents that T is not constrained at all, but that T can be anything you want it to be. And so moving forward, not only are we gonna use the square brackets attached to the right-hand side, in this case of the function name, but for every identifier that we list, we also need to apply a constraint. If they're all gonna have the same constraint, beautiful, we only have to list it once. If each one is going to have some different constraint, then we have to apply it individually. All right, I'm gonna get back to constraints when it comes to the last two examples. So for now, when you see any, I just want you to think anything. T can be anything. Also, you can name these generic type identifiers anything you want. I'm using the single letter T because I think in this particular case, it's the most readable way to do it. But I can call it Tom, my son's name with a capital T. I could even use lowercase t's. There's no restriction on how, how it's named. There's no concept of exporting and unexporting either. And this is an area of the, um, the not the draft, but this is a place where we're gonna have to, at some point before this is released, 
set up some nice idioms and guidelines about naming these generic types. But for now, you're gonna see me using just the single letter T for the examples that I'm gonna share. But if you go through other examples here beyond uh, the first five, you might see me using larger names. Okay, brilliant. So now, thanks to the square brackets, I'm able to tell the compiler that this T is a generic type that can be anything. And now when I write the input is a slice of T, I'm now able to say a slice of some type T to be determined later, most likely at compile time. Brilliant. And now that T represents a concrete type to be determined later, I'm now able to write five lines of code as if T was an int or already a string or something else. And we're back to our high levels of readability and comprehension. Now I want to run this code. And so on line 91, I've constructed a slice of int and on line 97, I've constructed a slice of strings. And I'm passing that slice to the different functions that we've already written here, knowing that really only print, reflect, and print are truly generic versions. Now, as I told you before we started, generics has not been implemented yet in the compiler. I'm going to stress it again. It has not been implemented. All that we have right now today is a tool called Go to go. And what the go to go tool does is it can transpile the new syntax into some form of buildable go today that then lets us actually run the code. Now, you do have the go to go playground, but as I told you, I'm running a special version of go from source in the go to go branch as of yesterday. And that version of go has a special tool called GoToGo Go as well, which you access the way I'm showing you. Now, I could do a build and get a binary, but I just want to run this. So I'm going to say run, and then I'm going to give it the GoTo file. Notice the source code extension is not .go, it's GoTo. And then that's going to allow the transpiler to create a generic .go and then build and run that. And when we do, we can see the same output regardless of the function that I use including our two generic functions, the one using reflect and the one using the new syntax. And the whole point of this really is this. What if I decide that now I need to work with floating point numbers? Well, instead of having to write more code, I just want to construct that slice. And then the idea is I can pass that to the two generic versions that we have, the use of the reflect package, and then the use of the new syntax. And the point now is I can run this again, and you can see I can now start printing out floating point numbers. But as we said, the reflect package code that I wrote isn't as readable and won't be as comprehensible to more Go developers than being able to all, you know, being able to use our language syntax and mechanics. And I think that's where there's a big win here. Now, notice that I keep calling this a list, right? This is a list of parameters, data input. This is a list of types with their constraints. Well, that's truly a list because one of the things that I can do is be very explicit at the call site and tell the compiler what T is going to be, which means that when I'm not doing that, how does the compiler know what T should be? This is me being explicit about T. I can pass that into the function, or I can let the compiler figure it out. We can let the compiler infer what the type is. Now, if I'm explicit with the type, I can still build and run this. I want to show you that. But the call doesn't look as similar with that in and without it. So a big part of the implementation here is the compiler's ability to infer what T is, in this case, at the call site at the time we hit compile. And that's why I said at compile time.
Now, in this situation, the compiler can infer the type because we're passing a slice of int in as our data parameter. And that first one, which is right here, it's the only one, is a slice of t. So the compiler is able to see the input as a slice of int and substitute t for int, or in this case, substitute for float. When the generic type is used as part of that input, well, that gives the compiler something that it can use to, to infer type. But if T wasn't being used as an input type, it was just being used somehow in the implementation, then the compiler wouldn't be able to infer the type. And then there you would have to be explicit about what T is, in this case, at the call site. So again, the whole idea here is that we need a way of telling the compiler that T is a type to be determined later. It is a generic type that will be determined at compile time, and that there is no constraint because it can be anything. And in this case, it's great that the compiler can infer what the type is based on the data input, but in cases where it can't, we can also pass the type information in just like we pass in data, and then the compiler doesn't have to try to figure it out. We're telling the compiler what T is. Brilliant, okay. So we've got our first kind of taste for the new syntax. We have a good understanding of why we need the new syntax. And we've seen that code uh, run uh, and execute there on my screen. Now, this was a fairly simple function, just printing values from a collection. But if we're going to be writing real world programs, well, Data is going to be critically important. If you've ever taken any of my classes, you'll hear me say all the time, if you don't understand the data, you don't understand the problem because all problems we solve with code are data transformation problems. And generics here, they're going to find themselves in the types that we want to declare for our code. And there are two different ways for you to declare a user-defined type. One is using the underlying type mechanics, and another one is using struct mechanics. And I'm going to show you both of them, starting with the declaration of an underlying type. Now, once again, I'm going to do what I did before. I will walk through a progression of code that we can write today, walking our way to the use of the new generic syntax. And what you see on line 16 is me declaring a user-defined type named vector int, whose base type represents an underlying type that is a slice of int. And on line 25, I'm defining another user-defined type called vector string, whose underlying type is a slice of string. Now, for both of these types, I've implemented a method named last. So last, this implementation of last is tied to the vector int. There's the receiver. This one is tied to a vector string. There's the receiver. And because this is tied to vector int, it needs to return an int. This one has to return a string. And the idea of last, regardless of whether it's a vector int or string, the idea of last is to return the last value or the value in the highest index position in the vector back to the caller. So you can see here on line 19, we check to see if the vector is empty, and if it is, we return an error. And the zero value for an int, this is an idiom and a guideline we follow in the, in the language on the returns, always use the literal zero value for those things that are not really being returned. In this case, the error is what's being returned, zero value for an int. In this case, the actual value at the highest index position is being returned, and nil is the zero value for an error. And if you look at the implementation for the string, it's not much different. We're going to check that the vector uh, a string is, is empty, and if it's empty, we return the zero value for a string, which is an empty string and an error, where we do this again. And if I wanted to work with a vector of floats, what do you think I'm doing? Exactly, I'm going to copy and paste and change those things out. And there's value in that in the sense that the code is going to be much more readable and comprehensible by more people. But I hear you. I know, right? That's just more code you have to maintain. 
and more changes that may need to take place um, in these implementations. So let's run that same experiment again. Can we do this in a generic way in Go today? And the answer is yes, once again, if we use the empty interface. Since the empty interface does not restrict the type of data that we can store in the vector. And so this vector interface is now using an underlying type, which is a slice of the empty interface. Now, this allows us to store data in a generic way. However, the semantics here are really different than the semantics we just looked at because this vector is not tied to a single type of data. We can store at the same time ints and strings and floats and users and widgets and anything you want, which actually can make the usability of this vector more complex. Because if you look at the implementation of last, last isn't returning a concrete type. It's returning the concrete data abstracted inside the empty interface. So when the caller call, calls last, they have no idea what kind of data they have unless they perform type assertions and or use reflection again. The implementation of this vector is the same. Check the empty. If it is empty, return the zero value, in this case of the empty interface, or return the value decouple, I mean coupled inside or abstracted inside the interface. Um, and then and then error. So the implementation isn't um, where we're going to have less comprehension. It's really the usability in this case. And so then the question is, is there value in being not have a vector that only works with one particular type at a time, but to still be able to do that with one set of code? And I think the answer again is yes. So once again, what I'm gonna do is remove the generics aspects of this code so we can kind of look at it first and then we'll bring it in. And you know, once again, what I'm trying to do on line 57. On line 57, I'm trying to say that I'd like to declare a vector whose underlying type is some type T to be determined later at compile time. That's what I'm trying to do. But again, we know this syntax doesn't work because in this particular case, the compiler is going to assume that somebody has declared T before we hit the build button. And once again, every time we want to talk about T to be determined later at compile time, what do we have to do? We've got to add those square brackets to the right-hand side of the identifier before it was the function name. Now it's the type's name. And now this tells the compiler what it needed to know that T is a generic type. Great. Now we can implement last with the understanding that T is going to be substituted for some actual concrete type later, you know, later, and therefore we can write code as if that's already the case. And we can go ahead again and check to see if the vector is empty. If it's not, we return the error. Um, I mean, if it is, we return the error. If it's not, we return a value of that correct type and then that nil. Now, there's a couple other things here that I kind of quickly passed over. Look at the receiver. You might think that the receiver should look like this since the type is vector. But remember, just using vector is not enough. It's not so much a vector. It's a vector of some type T the same type T that we're going to return, the same type T that we're declaring here. Remember when we were declaring meta functions, we had to do this. You don't have to do that with a method because a method is already attached to the type and the type already contains the list. So this is really nice. But I want you to always be realizing as it relates to these types, leveraging these generic type identifiers, in this particular case, it's not just vector, it's a vector of some type T, this type T, that can be anything. Returning a value of type T, which can be anything, which is based on the underlying type. Brilliant. Now the last thing here is zero value, which gets super interesting because we wanna be able to return the zero value 
of that type T regardless of what it is. Now your first thought might be to do this. You might say, Bill, why can't we use literal construction against type T to construct a value of type T to its zero value state? The problem is that this syntax doesn't work for every single possible potential type. It would work if this was a user. It doesn't work if we substitute an int for T. That is not proper syntax. And so we can't use empty literal construction here on the return. We need a way of being able to do zero value construction regardless of what T is. And right now in the language, you have two options here. The first option I'm showing you on line 60. In this option, we're going to use the keyword var to construct a value of type T to its zero value state and assigning it to a variable. This is universal. It doesn't matter if this is a user. It doesn't matter if this is an int. It doesn't even matter if it's a slice. This gives us zero value construction. Beautiful. And so this is an option. And then we can use that variable on the return. I like this because it maintains higher levels of comprehension and readability. That being said, there is another way to do this. There's another way to construct a value to a zero value state regardless of what T is. And that is with the built-in function new. Regardless if this is an int or a user or even a slice, we would get zero value construction. The problem, however, is that new returns a pointer to the zero value construction which means that we've got to add a dereferencing of that pointer to make the syntax work. Now, there are people who like that better because it does eliminate an extra line of code in terms of a variable. But when it comes to readability and comprehension, I don't think that a lot of Go developers, especially those new to the language, is going to understand the syntax. They're not going to understand new. They're not going to understand the dereferencing. And I think you lose some readability and comprehension with that. So for me, I'm going to be using zero variable. I'm going to be using variables like this until we have a better mechanic to do it. And it's quite possible that we end up with a better mechanic to do this. It's just not the highest priority right now uh, in terms of what we need to figure out uh, with new syntax. So this is kind of just sitting on the side. But really, at the end of the day, this isn't necessarily that bad anyway, and maybe we don't need anything else. Okay, so we've seen zero value construction now, and how we need a universal way to do that. And you saw the keyword var or the built-in function new. Now, with this all implemented, a vector that can be of any type t, we can go ahead and start playing with it. Now, you can see this code here is constructing vectors of int and constructing a vector of that string. These are the first vectors that I showed you. And we're using literal construction during uh, literal construction to populate it with some. And remember the big win with these vector types that I first implemented was that last always returns what we know. In this case, an integer. This last method returns a string. And so if I wanted to perform some some sort of operation against the value being returned. Well, I always know it's an integer. Well, I always know it's a string. And so it's easy to work with. Remember what I talked about with the vector interface? We can store different types of data in this, in this vector interface, integers and strings and floats. And the real problem is when I call last, I'm getting back an interface and I have no idea what type of concrete data is stored inside of this? I don't know that it was a floating point number. The only way I know that is by either using the reflect package or performing a type assertion. And so if I still need to apply this logic based on what type of value is returned by last, here I am having to do more type assertions. And I think it's why using the generic syntax here is better 
because we can construct vectors of the types we need and not have to worry about those type assertions again. Now, there's a couple of things I want to show you before we even look at the code below this. Once again, you can't construct a vector to a zero value state like this because remember, we need to tell the compiler what t is going to be. Do we want a vector of ints or strings or floats? Vector by itself is not enough. And so when it comes to zero value construction, you're going to see what we were doing on those function calls before, passing the information in for what t. This is going to be a vector that works with integers. We're being explicit. When it comes to zero value construction, there's no way for the compiler to infer anything. And so we have to be explicit here. Now, we could have done this if we know that we wanted to work with ints, I could use literal construction in the vector and not have to pass type information. The compiler can see the data that we want to store and then infer what T is going to be, right? This is a case where the compiler could infer type. Anytime we're talking about zero value construction, just no way. However, if you look on line 111, you're seeing that I'm still being explicit with the construction of a vector. You see this, not this. You see this. Why am I doing that? It's mainly because right now the, the tooling that we're using can't infer the type information here because it hasn't been implemented yet. And that's totally fair. I don't want the language team implementing every single detail and aspect of the draft document in the GoToGo -to -go tooling. That would be a waste of time. We want to get to the point where we're actually implementing this in the compiler. And so the GoToGo -to -go tooling really needs just the minimum amount of draft implementation possible that gives us the ability to experiment, prototype, and understand the new syntax. So when this is fully implemented in the compiler, we'll be able to do this. But right now we can't because it isn't fully implemented in the tooling. And that's why you see me passing explicitly the type information on these constructions. But what's beautiful is that when I call last, I know I'm getting back an integer. And when I call last on line 117, I'm getting back a string. And so I can perform that same logic again without the need of reflection or type assertions. And again, what's the big win? Like, what's the super big win here? The super big win is that I don't have to write more code if I want to work with suddenly a vector of floating point numbers, right? I can just construct a vector of float 64. What's also really cool is because I now know I'm working with floats, I could even use the correct verb on the printf for the data type that I'm using. Once I know the type, then I can work with that type with that knowledge as opposed to kind of being blind with the use of the empty interface on what type of data I'm working with. And if I do this, and we run 03. Oh, I'm in 02. That was a bummer. Then what you see is that I'm able to work with vectors of int, float, 64, and string uh, with no issues. Kind of nice. OK. So we're seeing here now how we could use a generic type list with a user-defined type where this type is being declared through the use of an underlying type, in this case, a slice of some type T. We see on the receiver that anytime we're going to talk about this user-defined type of vector, it's always going to be vector of some type T using our square brackets. We see that that's similar to that construction syntax. We see we can return type T, and we have different ways of constructing a value of that type T.
to its zero value state. Now, these underlying types are cool, but I would probably make an argument that the majority of us declare user-defined types using the keyword struct much more than we do using underlying types. So let's take a look at how generics can be applied to our struct types. Now, the best, I thought the best way of showing this is by starting to implement a, a new container type like a linked list. And I'm going to get rid of our syntax again so we can kind of talk about it. Now, a linked list is essentially composed of nodes that hold some for some type of data and then are connected together through pointers. And so if you see the node declaration on line 14, what I'm trying to do is say that I want this node to store uh, a value of some type T to be determined later at compile time, right? To be determined later. As soon as I say to be determined later at compile time, then we know immediately that on the right-hand side of the type name that identifier, we're going to do this, t, any. And now I'm telling the compiler, yep, t is to be determined later at compile time. Now, we do need next pointers and previous pointers. This is a double-linked list. And once again, you just can't say a pointer to a node. That's not enough. Plus, the next and previous nodes also have to be nodes that store the same type T data. And so we're back to using our square brackets on the node declarations here. And so whatever T is used to construct a node, that's the data we're storing. And those are the types of nodes that we can point to next and previous. All that T coming together. And you see on line 20, once again, that this list type is going to contain the first and last pointers to the list. This is how we access the list. And so once again, since T is involved, a type to be determined later at compile time, we're going to have this list, generic list type again, and T can be anything. Now to make this more interesting, I've added a method named add to our list type. And the idea is that we can add a node to this list by passing a value of some type T same type T that we're going to be constructing the list for. And the receiver is binding this method to our list of some type T using pointer semantics. And then we can return the node that we're constructing through pointer semantics of some type T. And you can see on line 26 where we're doing um, literal construction of a node of some type T, signing the data and the pointers. If you look at the rest of the code here, Think about it. Regardless of the data that we're going to store inside this list, this code here between line 30 and 37 doesn't change. The only code that's really kind of affected by what T is is the construction of a node. And this is where we're going to get big, huge wins for these container types because if I were to write out the rest of the methods for list, probably 80 plus percent of the code is the same regardless of the type of data that we're storing. And this is again where being able to define a type like list and node with a generic type T is really gonna help with our maintainability, our comprehension, our readability of our code because really it can be a node of any type. Really nice. Now to see this code work, in line 44, I'm defining another user-defined type called user. And then on line 53, I'm constructing, I'm constructing a list to its zero value state that works with user values. On line 59, I'm constructing a list to its zero value state that works with pointers of type user. Value semantics here, pointer semantics here. And because we're setting T to be a value of type user, our add method now accepts values of type user. Data is a value of type user. Because here we're setting T to be a pointer of type user, add accepts the address of a user, and this data are addresses. And we can see all of that by running 
the code and showing how print shows ampersand for address and shows nothing for value. So we see here the user has the ability to decide if they're using value semantics or pointer. You see, when I pass user here explicitly, because I have to, because we're doing zero value construction, essentially, we're telling the compiler this is going to be the situation, right? We're telling the compiler that we want to use this. Nice, right? Nice, nice, nice. When I pass a pointer of type user, then we're telling the compiler this. And so we can see that there's going to be this substitution, okay, for T based on how we construct our list, whether it's on line 53 with value semantics or line 59 with pointer semantics. Pretty nice. And you can see the beginnings of how we could leverage generic types in the declaration of fields for our struct-based user-defined types. And again, you're seeing the square T, are you seeing the square syntax when we're referencing these struct types that have generic type identifiers so that generic type can flow through the code at the time the compiler is determining either through inference or through an explicit um, call like that, what T is gonna be. Okay, this is good. So I've now shown you how to write a generic function where we can work with data of some type T. I've shown you how to declare user-defined types where there's an underlying type of some type T or struct type where there's fields of some type T. But we have to get back to the constraint conversation that I tried to ignore a little bit in the beginning of the talk because as we begin to write more and more practical functions for the data transformations that we're performing, the reality is that we're not gonna be able to use any type for T, that there are gonna be constraints on what T can be. Now, we have these types of constraints already, and one of those comes in the form of behavioral constraint. So I'm gonna start with that. Now, on line 13, I define a user-defined type named user, and I implement a method named string that returns a string on line 18. And the idea of this method is to be able to stringify a user, to take a user and put it into some string form, and you can see that I'm using JSON syntax for that. And I did the exact same thing for customer that I declared on line 22. I added a method named string that returns a string, and that stringified a customer, once again, using that JSON syntax. I could have used any stringification format I wanted. I just happened to use that. Now, what gets interesting are these two functions here. Because these functions that I've called stringify user and stringify customers, they're taking a slice of user or a slice of customer and they're trying to stringify all of them, returning a slice of string with each individual user stringified. And you can see the five lines of code needed to write that code, right? We'll construct that return slice based on the length of users we have. We'll forarrange using our language syntax and mechanics for our liter literal um, traversal. And then we'll call append to add the stringification of user requiring the method call to that new slice of string. Append to me is an interesting function. Actually, all the built-in functions are interesting. Append, copy, make, len, cap, delete. I'm sure I'm missing one. They're all interesting functions, the built-in functions. You know why? Because when you really think about it, they're generic functions, aren't they? All the built-in functions in Go are generic functions. Look at append. Append can take a slice of any type T and a value of that same type T and perform the appending operation against it. LEN can take a slice 
of any type. It's pretty cool. I mean, I could make an argument that Go already has generics between the reflect package and the built-in functions. It's already there. Now, let's be fair. The mechanics that the language team has to write functions like append and len and copy and make, well, those mechanics are not extended to us. So though the language team can write all the generic functions they want to today, we can't outside of the reflect package, which I've kind of tried to make the argument for when we use the reflect package to write generic code, we're working with an API and not our language syntax and mechanics, which is why I think the code is less comprehensible and less readable. But we see again that it's the same five lines of code really, regardless if we're working with users and customers and the big part of this also is the need to have that string method that has the intelligence for stringifying an entity like a user or a customer. Now, could I consolidate all these stringify functions into one? Yes, we've already had this conversation. I'm not gonna get into it. You already understand the mechanics and the semantics behind this. What's more interesting to me is can we do this in a generic way using the reflect package? Funny enough, the answer is yes. Now, this is 13 lines of code as opposed to five. And staring at this could hurt your brain because it's not obvious what the code is doing. At least definitely not as obvious when we get back to our language syntax and mechanics. But you can see here the use of the empty interface. You can see the call to reflect dot value. You can see again, we're checking to validate that it's a slice. If it's not, we return nil. You can see we're constructing the new slice of string based on the length of the slice that came in. Again, we can't use for range mechanics, but we can increment I over length. Here's the cool part. The reflect package is really nice. As we iterate over every value, in the slice that was passed in regardless of its type, we can check if that value has a method named string. Now this is a runtime check, not a compile time check. But still, we can check if it has a method named string and if it doesn't, while well, we return nil, we can't do this. But if it does, then we can finish the stringification by calling that method through that call um, right there on line 96. And then we can append the value back into that slice of string. So you see here, it takes 13 lines of code and again, more of that reflect package API, but we have the capability of doing it, even calling methods. But I don't wanna have to handle these 13 lines of code. I don't think that more Go developers can read and comprehend this code. I wanna get back to working with my language syntax and mechanics and still be able to do this in a generic way, and I can with the new syntax. Now, once again, as I've been doing, I'm removing that so we can look at this. And you know already what I want to do. I want to write a function named stringify that can accept a slice of some type t to be determined later at compile time to be determined later. As soon as you hear me say, oh, T is a generic type to be determined later, then what does that mean? It means now I need square brackets in front of the function name. I'm gonna name my generic type identifier and you've seen me doing any. Now I've got the same five lines of code I had before. Now will this build and compile? Let's take a look. Let's go into four. Whoa, I've got a compiler message. What is it saying? It's saying on line 114, we have a problem because I'm calling a method named string against a value of that generic type T, whatever it is. And the compiler has no information about whether T will have a method or values of type T will have a method named string. There it is. So based on this, the constraint or lack of constraint, the use of any 
isn't enough information for the compiler to guarantee that this code won't blow up because we can't pass any value we want. T can't be anything because not all values of type T may have a method named string. This is a behavioral constraint we must inform the compiler about. Now, this idea of behavioral constraint isn't new in the language. Think about it. I can write a function today named Bill, which accepts a value of type user. This is what I call a concrete function. It's a function that's accepting data based on what the data is, in this particular case, a user. But today I can also write a function named Bill, and that function could be defined not with a concrete type, or at least that parameter could be defined not with a concrete type, but an interface type. And when we use an interface type, like you see on line 115, I no longer call this a concrete function, I call it a polymorphic function. This is a traditional polymorphic function in Go. And I say that because polymorphism means that a piece of code changes its behavior depending upon the concrete data it is operating on. And in this particular case, when we use the stringer interface, which defines a method set of behavior of a method named string that returns a string, what this function now says is, I will accept a value of any type as long as that value exhibits the full method set of behavior defined by stringer, in which case has a method named string that returns a string. You see this function is applying a behavioral constraint against the data. It will only accept data that has that behavior. And that is something that can be checked at compile time. Beautiful, right? And so we're already using interfaces today to declare behavioral constraints that can be checked at compile time. So we can write these polymorphic functions and allow a function to accept different types of data, but based on what that data can do. Because when we write functions based on what data is, that's when we have to write different versions for different data types. Nice. But remember something about your generic functions. They're not traditional polymorphic functions. They're really concrete functions. T, though right now, is a generic type to be determined later at compile time. It does eventually represent a concrete type, not an interface. And therefore, our generic functions are really concrete functions. They're really accepting data based on what it is. However, we have a behavioral constraint here on line 114 that we have to satisfy. So what the current draft says is the following. Instead of introducing something new, why not leverage the interface to apply behavioral constraint for our generic, in this case, functions, just like we're doing for traditional polymorphic functions? And so if I want to fix the compiler message, what I have to do is tell the compiler, look, T can't be anything. It can only be a type whose value that we will pass in, associated with this slice, whose values implement the stringer interface. And that gives us a guarantee that value, which is a value inside the slice, We'll have a method named string, and this code won't blow up when we're running it in production. This now gives the compiler the information it needs to perform the compiler checks for the data integrity. It's this little bit of information that helps the compiler give us the integrity we want at compile time, not at runtime, just like we're getting with our traditional polymorphic functions. And so the constraint now leveraging the interface, that gives us the ability to build and run this code 
with the highest level of integrity possible because now the compiler will never allow us to work with some type T whose values won't implement the stringer interface. Oh, nice. Okay. But I've got one more example that I need to show you before we're done. And this one might be the most difficult one of all because this now requires us to introduce some more syntax because we now have to focus on a constraint that we don't have today in the language. We now have to consider constraints that are not just based on methods, but based on the type of operations that can be performed on a piece of data. Operations? Yeah, operations like adding and subtracting and division and maybe bit manipulation. These are operations that we perform on concrete data. And now the fact that we're going to be writing code for some type T to be determined later, we have to make sure that T is something that can be used in the operations that we may be performing. So let me show you that. I'm going to do this again like I always do because I know it helps me. Focus here on line 16. You know what I want to do. I want to write an add function that accepts a value of some type T to be determined later and a second value of type T to be determined later. And I want to be able to add those type two types or those two uh, pieces of data together to return a new value of that same type T. I want to add these things. Now, if T ends up being an int, well, guess what? If t ends up being an int, then guess what? We got no problem because we can add ints. But what if t ends up being a user? You can't do that. There's no concept of adding two struct values together. And we absolutely don't and will not have operator overloading in the language at least anytime soon. So you're not even going to be able to apply that sort of behavior anyway. And guess what? You might say, well, string is supported. Yeah, for adding, but not subtracting. And so we're kind of back to a situation now where you know I want to say that T is a type to be determined later. And you might say, well, Bill, let's apply our square brackets is to show that t is a generic type to be determined later. But if I say any, we're in trouble because it can't just be anything. It has to be only types that will be supported through the use of the plus operation. So now we're back to needing a constraint, almost a constraint that says add only. I need an add only constraint. But how I, do I define this? Hmm. This is where we need some new syntax. Now, the draft is currently experimenting with this. And the idea, again, is not to add anything new and leverage the interface as a way of, again, applying constraints for these generic types. However, this isn't based on a method set now. It has to be based on a set of types that T is going to be restricted to. And in this case, what we're saying is that the add only interface is going to restrict or constrain a generic type to just be a type in this list. So now only these types can be used for T at the time that, that we want to um, call add and the compiler can validate that. And by the way, if you have a user-defined type with an underlying type, well, that matches. So in this case, Bill would also be able to be used. However, you know, if you do things like this, which we know won't support that operation, oh, we'll just keep it here, you could still pass Bill 
you could, or you could still add Bill to this list. It wouldn't be necessary because the underlying type would match. But one thing you start to realize is that if this type list is restricted to just those types that you're defining, well, that's not extended or extendable by anybody else in the programming language, right? It's not like how interfaces are extended. In other words, um, you can have concrete types that have behaviors and I can write an interface in my own packages and they can conform. Here you're kind of restricting. And so using the underlying types is really a clean way of being able to kind of define these constraints across different packages. Okay. Now there's some other problems with this syntax that the language team absolutely recognizes and then I want to show. Remember when I was talking about our traditional polymorphic functions and how they're based on the idea that they will accept any concrete piece of data as long as it exhibits the right method set of behavior defined by the interface. Well, this interface doesn't define a method set of behavior, which means that this interface can't be used in a polymorphic function. This doesn't work. It doesn't even make sense. And this is kind of kind of iffy because this is maybe one of the first times in the language where we've got something we can define and it's kind of restricted where it can be used. You know, we don't have a lot of that in the language. So the language team isn't very happy about that as well. The idea that we can define an interface that no longer can be used in a polymorphic function because it doesn't define any polymorphic behavior. So when you do something like this, as soon as you add a type list to be able to restrict the set of types that in this case T can be, it's only an interface that can be used with generics and would only be able to be used here. Now, there are some ideas floating around about how to maybe fix this, or not fix it, but other ideas that could be viable. But before I share them with you, let me show you at least the last two things here. The draft is also experimenting with the idea of these pre-declared type constraints. And there's one here that's been implemented called comparable. And comparable, the idea is it would uh, support these types of operations where we're comparing if two things are, are equal, right? And here we can use struct values. We can't use slices, but we can use struct values. And there are ideas floating around about a package in the standard library that may have a common set of these type constraints. But the last little piece of syntax that I want to share with you is here. Look at these two types, person and food. Notice that they're implementing match behavior that accepts values of their type. This accepts a value of type person. This accepts a value of type food. Okay, now let's go back to some of the things that we said and we will kind of review everything with this matcher example. You know what I want to do here. I want to write a function named match, which accepts a slice of some type T to be determined later, and a slice and a value of type T to be determined later, same, same type T, with the idea that I'm going to range over that slice of some type T, and for each value in the collection, call the match method, passing that value of type T into it to determine if there's a match. So what do we know already? We know since T is a type to be determined later, since T is a generic type, we can kind of do this blindly. However, we know we can't use any because we're already saying here that values of type T need to have match behavior. And so we know we're going to have to upgrade the constraint from any to maybe a matcher. Now we have to think about defining matcher because the method needs to be a method that returns bool, but accepts a value of that type T. And so if you look here on line seven, you can see how I'm declaring an interface type with this generic type T that can be anything, using T as the parameter for the match method, which now allows me to write a behavioral constraint where that value much, must have a method named match 
that accepts a value of that same type t. Pretty cool. And now I've got a generic function with the right constraint and an interface helping me apply the constraint. Now, what you saw me remove was this type list. And I did that, well, I did that because we really don't need the type list in this case. The only constraint that we really have in this function is behavioral. I mean, if I wrote the code like this, then we would need some form of a type constraint or we would need to compose the interface with comparable in order to do that. But I'm not writing code like this, so we don't need it. Why do I have this in here? I have it in this because I want to share with you that this is a possibility. You could define an interface that has both behavioral constraint and type constraint. There's nothing restricting you from doing this. Now, I will be honest with you, I have not found, nor have I met anybody yet, that found a practical reason to do this, to have both type and behavioral constraint in the same interface. And if we come to the conclusion that we don't need this, then I think it can simplify some things that I was talking about up here. You see, I told you that T can only have one constraint associated with it. You can't have a list of interfaces, only one. So if we do end up with some situation where you're going to be saying that you need both, then, we're, then it becomes a very complicated problem. But if we don't need both, then there are some interesting ideas here because we could just do that or something similar, couldn't we? And then, then we don't wouldn't need to have an interface at all. We could also maybe, this would be a little more work on the compiler, we could kind of tell the compiler what operations so the compiler could probably figure that out anyway in the code. And again, it would eliminate the need for the interface. In other words, there may be a solution out there which doesn't require us to declare an interface that we know won't be usable in our traditional polymorphic functions. And this is an aspect of the draft right now that needs some work. And the language team is very, very interested in thoughts and ideas around this. And so if you have any thoughts and ideas around how we can improve this and potentially not break interfaces, um, everybody is all ears, all ears. Okay, so guess what? We got through the five examples kind of within that hour and 10 minutes I said it was going to take. Hola, gracias por quedarte hasta el final del video. Recuerda que puedes ver más contenido como este en nuestro canal de todos los eventos a los que asistimos porque We Love Devs. Y acuérdate de darle like, compartir, suscribirte y darle a la campanita para que estés al pendiente de todo nuestro nuevo contenido. Además, seguimos en todas nuestras redes sociales para que siempre estés al día sobre todo lo que subimos. Además, aquí te dejamos otros videos para que los puedas ver. Exacto. Gracias.